Um, the House of Commons, even, even the ante room is where, is, is not where you come for intellectual conversation, certainly not the disinterested and thoughtful conversation that we more commonly associate with the common rooms or the Newsnight Review studio. Um, and it's odder in a way, but when it comes to questions of what our intelligentsia are up to, that it should be me, a Conservative MP, addressing this question, because the Conservatives are famously the stupid party, and in the past Conservatives have regarded this as a badge of pride rather than something to be ashamed about. The Conservative Party has felt that it's in tune with the broad British sense that intellectuals are creatures who one should regard with, uh, at best, suspicion, and at worst, distaste. Um, you may be familiar with uh, the works of um, two particular, typically English cartoonists, Pont and Osbert Lancaster. Um, Pont has a series of cartoons entitled The British Character, in which he depicts uh, the British people in the 1940s in a number of characteristic poses. Uh, so, for example, he shows the British with their uh, particular interest in country houses, or the British with a particular fondness for breakfast eaten in silence. Um, but one of the most potent is Pont's, character, Pont's cartoon where he says, the British character, suspicion of intellectuals. And there you see a drinks party, composed of genial and attractive people, much like all of you. And there you see the figure who is the intellectual. And he's an ill-favoured individual, <laughs> his hand tucked into a rather ugly corduroy jacket, haranguing a rather beautiful woman in the corner of the room, while everyone else looks on in horror. Um, Osbert Lancaster, rather more uh, piquantly, subverted the whole idea um, in one of his costumes in the 1950s, where he has uh, the Earl of Littlehampton, uh, his particular uh, ideal English aristocrat, in his club, sunk deep in a leather armchair, turning to one of his companions and looking over a copy of the, uh, of the Times, which reports what's been happening in the Soviet Union. And he turns to his friend and he says, Freddie, which are we? Workers, peasants, or intellectuals? <laughs> and the, the suspicion of intellectualism runs deep in uh, the British character. And indeed, um, a British intellectual, with the curiously unenvious name of Stephen Colleen, has written a whole book recently, Absent Minds, which argues that uh, the British hostility towards intellectualism has been one of our Achilles' heels. And the Conservative Party, generally, has rejected the Colleen view and argued that we're at our best, the nation is at its best, politicians are at their best, when they take a pride in practice, when they distrust abstract ideas. The very word intelligence here, in many respects, is alien to English, and particularly Tory English, political culture. But I think that it's a mistake to ignore uh, or to disparage what's happening in the intellectual arena in Britain and elsewhere. I take the view, in the words of the uh, American conservative thinker Richard Weaver, that ideas have consequences. I believe that it's through winning and engaging in intellectual battles that you shift public opinion and you make political possibilities um, out of ideas and concepts which had previously been regarded as marginal or eccentric. And I pray in aid, very briefly, what happened in the 1970s here in the United Kingdom. Um, everything that happened in the 1980s, the crude mechanical changes that Margaret Thatcher made to our economy and elsewhere, would have been impossible without an intellectual battle being joined by a small minority group of figures who were economic liberals who changed the terms in which we thought of politics. Now, I mentioned that uh, when we talk about intellectuals in this country, we still tend to use derogatory terms. We tend to speak about the chattering classes, the talking heads, the liberal establishment, um, the literati, or in David Blunkett's coinage, the liberati. Um, and behind all of these phrases, there lurks a sense, which I think is true, and which Peter alluded to, that the intelligentsia in this country tend to be predominantly left or left liberal. If you look, for example, at the arena that, uh, that Peter mentioned earlier, where you're likely to find intellectuals, the Newsnight Review studio, think of the names of the people who are likely to crop up there, um, either in the studio or as the subject of discussion. Tom Paulin, Jermaine Greer, uh, Jonathan Glover, Harold Pinter, um, John Pilger, or, uh, okay, uh, forgive me, Echo Esham, any of the figures you're likely to see appearing, any of those whose works are being discussed, which have a political slant, tend, uh, overwhelmingly to be on the left. Um, and one of the, uh, the curious kinks to that is that um, uh, however much the English might uh, still feel a chill when they talk about the intelligentsia, uh, that chill 
is all the more uh, uh, scary. If you were to use the phrase right-wing intellectual, in fact, um, calling someone a right-wing intellectual is possibly the most damning term that you can deploy in English conversation. It implies conscious wickedness. Someone, <laughs> who's, <laughs> someone who's in love with Wagner, Tweed, and the torture of small animals. <laughs> People like Roger Scruton, Morris Cowling, or Andrew Roberts. Um, and there's only one thing worse, of course, than an English right-wing intellectual, and that's a right-wing U.S. intellectual. Uh, someone who is in hock to big oil, big tobacco, and is anxious to erect a big brother state. Um, names like Milton Friedman, Paul Wolfowitz, and Irving Kristol are, are in fact bogeys that you use to frighten small children these days, uh, rather than distinguished contributors to a broader intellectual conversation. Um, and one of the things that I, I do want to stress is that um, while I deprecate that, and while I believe that what the New Culture Forum is attempting to do is to reclaim the concept of respectable intellectualism on the right, I do acknowledge why it is the case that um, most intellectuals, uh, or people who wish to start themselves as intellectuals, tend to be on the left. Uh, Ian McLeod, a past conservative politician, made the point that if you were to take a, a group of ten uh, undergraduates and were to divide them five left, five right, those five who were on the right were likely to go into banking or accountancy or other professions like uh, medicine or the law. Those five uh, undergraduates who were on the left were far more likely become tenured academics, broadcasters, film directors, civil servants. Those five on the left are far more likely to form uh, uh, the, a willing uh, set of recruits for the intelligentsia, while those five on the right of equal intellectual power will likely to devote their intellectual power either to making money or to making things work. And so in that sense, we shouldn't, um, uh, I think, uh, take the uh, preponderance of left-wing views in the intelligentsia as something which is uh, a disastrous departure from human nature. It reflects one aspect of human nature. I should enter a writer, however, at this point. As people like uh, Shelley and others have pointed out, if you look at the annals of English literature, you will find that most of the best writers and poets are conservatives, whether it's T.S. Eliot, W. B. Yeats, Shakespeare, uh, Wordsworth, Pope, or Dryden. There is a distinguished tradition, a great tradition, of uh, Tory or Conservative uh, English writers. But in general, the intell intelligentsia is being, it has been seen as being on the left. And indeed, the left-wing intelligentsia has actively sought to involve itself in political conversations in a way that some right-wing intellectuals have shied away from. If you think of um, Dame Antonia Fraser's Camden Hill Group in the 1980s, or Charter 88, or even if one thinks more recently of the Nexus movement, which was set up in the 1990s to provide intellectual support to new labour. The active involvement of academics, writers, and thinkers in politics has tended to come from the left. And that has been sharply underlined by recent events, by which I particularly mean uh, the reaction to 9-11 and its aftermath, the war on terror. One of the distinguishing things about the intellectual voices that have been raised since then is the way in which so many of them have succumbed to anti-Americanism or anti-Western or broad, anti-Westernism more broadly. Um, if you think of people, for example, like the individual who came top recently in Prospect's poll of the most influential world intellectuals, Noam Chomsky. If you think of the individual who managed to make it into the top 10, John Pilger. If you think of one of the others in the top 20, just bubbling under, Harold Pinter. All of them, if you think about their intellectual output in the last five years, the dominant meme, to use a term from another intellectual, Richard Dawkins, has been anti-Americanism. But it goes much wider than those figures. Pluck almost any writer, or the name of any writer from the air, who's been inclined to stray onto the op-ed pages of any of our major newspapers, and you'll find again that same strain of anti-Americanism being the dominant aspect of, uh, of their discourse. Whether it's been Aaron Darty Roy, A.L. Kennedy, or even John McCarthy in The Times, anti-Americanism and sneaking regard for America's enemies has been the distinguishing feature and in the same way, if you think about those uh, journalistic voices who have been dominant during that period on the left, people like John Snow or Seamus Milne or indeed almost any of the commentators on The Guardian, but even on the right as well, Max Hastings, Simon Jenkins, Corelli Barnett, the view has been suspicious of America, hostile to the war on terror, and as I say, sometimes possessed of a sneaking regard for America's 
antagonists.